In 2019, the United States reported just over 609,000 missing people. In California, it's an average of roughly 2,200 people annually, Florida an average of 1,252, and in Texas, 1,246. In 1997, the United States reported its highest count ever of 980,712 missing people. 24 hours must pass before a person can be reported missing, and after missing for 48 hours, chances of being found drops by 50%. 72 hours and your chances of being found alive or found at all becomes almost non-existent. Regardless of the statistics, these are very real disappearances that happen every day. When we research cases, we look for the ones that stand out to us, and we found three that left us scratching our heads. And here are their stories. Marjorie West May 8, 1938, Bradford, Pennsylvania, Marjorie West, 4 years of age at the time, and her sister Dorothea, 11 years of age, were out picking flowers among a day full of other activities. After picking an entire bouquet each, Dorothea walked to their family vehicle to give the bouquet to their mother. When Dorothea reportedly walked a little ways away from her sister to hand her mother the flowers, she turned around and Marjorie was gone. Earlier that same day, Marjorie and Dorothea attended church with their brother Alan, seven years of age at the time, father Shirley, and their mother Cecilia. Shirley was an engineer at Kendall Refining, which was only a few blocks away from their home. To give you an idea of the West's travel on May 8, 1938, the day Marjorie went missing, it is reported that the family went directly from their home to church. It is not reported which church, however, we can assume it was within the city limits of Bradford. From church, they went to a spot in the Allegheny Forest where Marjorie went missing, roughly 30 miles from church, and from the forest directly to the city of Kane, which is an additional 10 miles from the forest. Dorothy reported recalling her father, Shirley, telling her and Marjorie to not go behind a specific large bull while picking flowers. They were mostly worried about rattlesnakes and not being able to see the girls. When Dorothea turned around and noticed her sister was no longer behind her, the initial thought was that she had wandered into the forest and got lost. After searching for a while, the family arrived in Kane to report her disappearance to the police. The police force in Kane was able to provide 200 workers and volunteers to go back to the clearing in Allegheny the same day to do a search. By the next day, upwards of 500 people had joined the search. By the 10th of May, police brought in bloodhounds. One important find was a crushed bouquet of flowers. It was laying on the ground not far from the boulder Shirley had asked the girls to stay away from. Without finding Marjorie and having no progress, the assumption was that someone possibly abducted Marjorie from the side of the road. The Kane police force identified three vehicles that had traveled through that same area around the time the Wests were there. One witness reported a single male in a Plymouth speeding from the area the Wests were, so fast that he had driven the witness off the road and into a ditch. Three days after Marjorie went missing, the mayor requested upwards of 1,000 volunteers to search and assist the police force and existing volunteers. He received 2,500. Searching hundreds of square miles, shoulder to shoulder, pumping out wells, mass producing a missing persons poster, and an additional five months of searching yielded no results. Newspapers covering the disappearance were linking it with a 1910 case where two boys vanished in the same area of the Allegheny Forest within a few hours of each other. One of the victims was Edward Adams, age 9, who was fishing with his friends when he heard a man cursing in the woods. The group of friends ran from the area out of fear, but when they cleared the forest, Edward was gone and never seen again. The second victim was Michael Steffen, age 7, who also went fishing with friends later that same day. One of Michael's friends reported they were walking and talking and when he turned around, Michael was no longer behind him. The two boys were abducted in the same forest on the same day, roughly 13 miles and a few hours apart. Newspapers detailed at the time that a man by the name of Mr. Aerosmith reported his mentally ill son, Harry, age 32, had wandered off in the same area around the same time for a week. When he returned, he claimed to have knowledge of the boys. 13 days after the disappearance, a mail carrier found a handwritten note which read, We'll return boy for $10,000. This was the only clue found in both disappearances. This theory never panned out due to the fact that these disappearances occurred 28 years before Marjorie disappeared and were both 11 and 19 miles away from her location. A taxi driver in Thomas, West Virginia claimed at 11.38 p.m. in the night of her disappearance, he saw a crying girl matching Marjorie's description and wearing similar clothes riding in a dark green sedan with an unidentified man possibly in his mid-30s. He spoke with the individual who claimed it was his own daughter and asked where the nearest motel was. 
After the taxi driver directed him across the street to an open establishment, he left a girl in the car and went into the motel but was denied a room due to no vacancy. He then walked back to the car and asked the taxi driver if he knew where any local liquor stores were. Several days after this interchange is when the taxi driver reported this incident. The unidentified man was also seen a day or two later in Thomas, Virginia at a local gas station refueling his vehicle. The gas station attendant claimed he saw a bundle wrapped in a gray blanket in the backseat of the car. While investigating this lead, authorities concluded that Marjorie was abducted around 3 p.m. Thomas, Virginia, is located 8 hours from the abduction site, which would have put them in the town of Thomas 48 minutes before the taxi driver spoke with the unidentified male and saw the girl who matched Marjorie's description. No further leads have been found and the investigation is currently open and cold. Brianna Maitland March 19, 2004, Brianna Maitland was working her shift as a dishwasher at the Black Lantern Inn in Montgomery, Vermont. Near the end of her shift, a group of her friends asked if she wanted to have dinner. She declined as she had to be up early and begin a shift at her second job as a waitress in St. Albans, Vermont. She left the Black Lantern Inn shortly after midnight to drive home, where she lived with a roommate in Sheldon, Vermont. By the 23rd, a few days later, her friend had assumed Brianna went to stay with her parents for the time being since she never returned home. The roommate called Mr. and Mrs. Maitland to check in on Brianna who disturbingly informed the roommate that she wasn't there. The Maitlands were under the impression their daughter was still living with her roommate at that time. The initial missing persons report was filed on the 23rd of March 2004. Brianna was born on October 8, 1986 in Burlington, Vermont. She was the daughter of Bruce and Kelly Maitland and was raised in a rural farm near the U.S.-Canadian border along with her older brother. Throughout her early life, she was trained in jiu-jitsu and on her 17th birthday, she made the decision to move out of her parents' rural farmhouse and begin an independent life as an adult on her own. There was reportedly no stress within the household. Her decision to move out was based on being closer to friends who attended a different school. When she moved out, she moved 15 miles away and enrolled for her last year of high school at Enosburg Falls High in Enosburg Falls, Vermont. During this final year of high school, her living situation changed many times as she moved in and out with multiple different friends. By February 2004, she dropped out of high school due to her unstable living situation and moved in with her friend Jillian Stout in Sheldon, Vermont, roughly 20 miles away from her parents' rural farmhouse. Three weeks before Brianna's disappearance, she got into a physical altercation. The attack was carried out by her friend Keely Lacrosse. The reason for the attack was never cleared up, however, it was reported Keely was jealous that Brianna and an unnamed male at the party were close and interested. Acting. A friend of Brianna's who also attended the party claimed she refused to fight with her friend Keely, and as a result, Brianna received several blows to the face while sitting in the passenger seat of a vehicle. Brianna ended up with a broken nose and a concussion and later filed charges against Keely. These charges would be dropped three weeks after Brianna's disappearance. In the earlier parts of the day, Brianna went missing. She took an exam to obtain her GED and spent the afternoon with her mother to celebrate. The two had lunch together and planned to shop at local stores. Her mother Kelly reported they had a wonderful afternoon and Brianna was very happy to have taken her exam. During their time shopping together, Kelly claimed Brianna told her, I have to leave, I'll be back later, and left the checkout line they had both been standing in. Brianna exited the store as Kelly continued waiting in line to make her purchase. After Kelly left the store, she went looking for Brianna. When she found her, her daughter was unnerved, shaken up, and very agitated. At this point, Brianna told her mother she needed to go home and get ready for her shift at the Black Lantern Inn. Kelly dropped her daughter off at the current residence she shared with her friend Jillian Stout around 3.45 p.m., not knowing that this would be the last time she ever sees Brianna. The day after her last sighting on March 20th, her vehicle was found. She drove a pale green 1985 Oldsmobile sedan, which was located abandoned off of East Berkshire Road and Route 118, just across from Dutchburn Farm Road. This is about a mile outside of Montgomery, Vermont. Strangely enough, when the vehicle was located, it was backed into the side of an abandoned barn. The back right half of her vehicle had punctured a hole in the old Dutchburn barn, leaving major damages to the building and minor damages to the car. Later, the police would conclude this could have been a staged accident to prove a false sense of what actually occurred the evening of March 19, 2004. Inside of Brianna's car, they found many items including the majority of her clothes, two uncashed paychecks, her makeup, contact lenses, driver's license, and her medications. Most of these items were thrown about on the ground in front of the vehicle, and an additional woman's fleece jacket that did not belong to Brianna was found in the field just beside the car. The car was discovered the day after Brianna was last seen, and two days before anyone realized she was missing. 
The police did not initially report the abandoned car to her parents, even though the car was registered to Brianna Maitland as the owner. With the information gathered from her uncashed paychecks, the police did attempt to speak with Brianna at her place of employment, but obviously never spoke with her. Three days later, the abandoned vehicle and her disappearance were connected, and the official missing persons report was filed. Once the disappearance of Brianna was made public, several witnesses came forward with information and sightings regarding the abandoned car. One witness claimed she was driving past the barn around 11.30 p.m. March 19 and 12.30 a.m. March 20 and noticed the car parked right next to the barn. He recalled the car's headlights were on, but he did not see anyone inside or around the vehicle. A second witness drove past the barn around 12.30 a.m. March 20th and reported the car's turn signal was on and flashing. Around 4 a.m., a former boyfriend of Brianna's drove past the barn after a night of partying across the border in Canada and recalled recognizing the vehicle and wondered if it was Brianna's car. He never stopped and checked and did not see anyone in or around the vehicle. The following morning, many other motorists drove past the scene one who even stopped because he found it so strange that so many personal items were thrown about that he took pictures of that scene and found a necklace on the ground beside the car. Although many witnesses provided information about the car and its disturbing scene, nobody came forward with information as to her whereabouts until a week later, an anonymous tip claimed Brianna was being held against her will in a house near Berkshire, Vermont. The home belonged to Ramon Ryans and Nathaniel Jackson, two known drug dealers from New York. On April 15, 2004, the home was raided in an attempt to locate Brianna. They discovered large amounts of drugs, but no sign of Brianna Maitland. Throughout the years, many individuals have called in with different records as to what happened to Brianna. One caller told police that she was tied to a tree in the woods. Another claimed she was at the bottom of a lake. In 2004, an unnamed older female sent in a letter and claimed Ramon Ryans and Nathaniel Jackson were responsible for the disappearance and death of Brianna a week after the 19th and that the incidents transpired over money for drugs. Without getting into graphic detail, it was reported by the older female that Brianna was stored in a basement and later disposed of on a pig farm. These claims were investigated by authorities but never corroborated. In 2006, a woman resembling Brianna was found on a casino security footage. The woman was never identified and her case remains open and unsolved to this day. Rico Harris October 10, 2014. Rico Harris was in the process of traveling from Alhambra, California to Seattle, Washington by car. The last record of his whereabouts put him in Lodi, California at 10.45 a.m. 45 minutes later, he texted his significant other and left her a message saying he was tired and was going up to the mountains to rest. He then turned off his phone and hasn't been seen since. Rico was born on May 19, 1977, making him 37 years old when he disappeared. He was born to Margaret and Henry Harris. Henry was a professional basketball player, which ultimately led to Rico's career as a Harlem Globetrotter. Throughout his early teens, he focused on playing basketball, getting good grades, and staying out of trouble in order to make a career as a professional basketball player and provide a better life for his family. Eventually, he moved to Los Angeles, California and led his basketball team to victory, which earned him a spot with the Harlem Globetrotters. Unfortunately, Rico's career in basketball ended only two months after being picked up by the team due to an injury. In an attempt to break up a fight in Southern California, Rico was hit in the head with a baseball bat, which he claims led to his fallout with the team. He no longer was a fan of the gimmicks the team portrayed and stated his back and coordination issues were due to the injury. Over the next decade, Rico racked up 16 cases before the Los Angeles County Superior Court. Some of the charges included burglary, public intoxication, trespassing, and possession of illegal narcotics. He moved from Los Angeles back to Alhambra, California into his mother's house without a job or any plans as to what he wanted to do other than play basketball. He soon turned to drinking and developed an addiction to heroin and methamphetamine. A friend even claimed that he would snort Ajax just to feel the burn. He was arrested over a hundred times, most commonly for public intoxication, and any attempts made to get him off of his self-destructive path failed many times. In 2007, shortly after he turned 30, he suffered an overdose of prescription medication and made his own decision to go into rehab. He managed to stay clean for years and even held down a job as a security guard where he met a woman named Jennifer Thong. Rico and Jennifer started dating and in early 2014, they even discussed getting married. Slowly, he began moving his belongings from Alhambra to her home in Seattle and found a new career as a sales rep selling vacation timeshares. In late September 2014, Jennifer began noticing changes in Rico and eventually confronted him about his changing behavior when Rico admitted to having a relapse in August. On October 8, 2014, Rico told Jennifer he wanted to drive around Seattle to get familiar with the area and explore the city he was about to permanently move to. 
Jennifer went to the gym during his venture. When she came home, Rico wasn't there and she assumed he was still exploring Seattle. When she texted him, he informed her he was halfway through Oregon and headed for Alhambra, California. A few hours later, around 2 a.m. on October 9th, Rico made it to Alhambra and went straight to his mother's home. His mother claimed his arrival in the middle of the night was concerning and she felt that he had been drinking. He stayed only one day in Alhambra and his mother noticed the entire time he was there, he didn't sleep at all. Around 10.45 p.m. October 9th, Rico's mother asked him to get some sleep before heading back to Seattle the next day. He wanted to return to Seattle no later than 7 p.m on the 11th to attend a barbecue Jennifer's neighbor was throwing, so he declined his mother's request to get some rest and continued to stay up. Around 1 a.m. on October 10th, Rico called his mother while driving back to Seattle. His mother Margaret didn't even know he had left and started his journey back home. After speaking with his mother, Rico called Jennifer, who was also surprised he was already heading back to Seattle, as he had only been in Alhambra less than 24 hours. According to Jennifer, they spoke on the phone for 3 or 4 hours and claimed she was very worried about him due to the fact that he hadn't slept for nearly 40 hours and was 400 miles into a 1200 mile trip. During the phone call, Jennifer fell asleep. She woke up around 8am and called Rico immediately for an update and to ensure he was safe. He answered and let her know he was near Sacramento in Lodi, California getting gas. After speaking briefly at the gas station, both his mother Margaret and girlfriend Jennifer tried calling Rico but were unable to get a hold of him. Around 10.45 a.m. is when Rico texted Jennifer informing her he was sorry for missing her calls and told her he was tired and was heading into the mountains to get some rest. Jennifer tried calling him multiple times after receiving the text, but her calls went directly to voicemail. When Rico didn't arrive home after 8 p.m. on October 10th, Jennifer called his mother Margaret and asked if they should file a missing persons report. They both decided it would be too soon to do so and thought it would be best to wait it out. On October 12, 2014, in Yolo County, an unnamed sheriff's officer was in the middle of doing a routine inspection of a parking lot in an isolated area in Yolo County Regional State Park called Lower Sight. He discovered a black Nissan Maxima parked in the far side of the lot, but didn't think much of it until he came across the same vehicle in the same spot during his inspection the following day. When the sheriff's office ran the plates and discovered it belonged to Rico Harris from Alhambra, he contacted the Alhambra Police Department, who went directly to his mother, Margaret, to inform her of the abandoned vehicle. Vehicle. At this time, Margaret called Jennifer and they decided to file a missing persons report. Soon after the missing persons report was filed, a search of Cache Creek Canyon began. The search included teams on the ground, search helicopters, search dogs, a thermographic camera, and spanned a five mile radius of where Rico's abandoned car was located. The search continued for three days without any results. This was particularly puzzling to the search and rescue team due to Rico's size. At the time, he was nearly 7 feet tall and weighed 300 pounds, which would make him very noticeable and therefore, they could not imagine such a large person disappearing so suddenly without any sightings. Shortly after the failed search, the police department went public with his description, which yielded some results. One passerby says he saw a man matching Rico's description walking along the road on October 11th around 5.20 p.m. Another witness reported seeing Rico sitting on a guardrail that overlooked the creek near the parking lot where his car was discovered. During the search for Rico, his car was taken to the police department and searched. In the vehicle, they found two bottles of alcohol, his wallet, and most of his credit cards. His cell phone, discover card, and driver's license were all not located in the vehicle. It was assumed he took those belongings with him. Eight days after Rico's disappearance on the 18th of October, a motorist called in reported seeing a mail that matched Rico's description. The witness also described the clothing he was wearing, which matched up with the clothing Margaret said he left her home in. When the police followed up with the sighting, they found Rico's size 18 footprints consistent with his sneakers on a trail near the creek where his vehicle was found. His backpack was also discovered leaning against a guardrail near where one of the witnesses reported seeing him sitting overlooking the creek. Inside of the backpack, police discovered his phone, which contained pictures of him hiking along the trails nearby his vehicle. In some of the photos, he was posing in a funny manner in front of the signs that ate visitors. Along with the photos, the police discovered videos that didn't appear to be taken intentionally. In the videos recorded on Rico's phone, he was seen singing to songs while sitting in his car. While singing, Rico was throwing CDs into the passenger seat of the car. The videos were timestamped the night of October 10, 2014. The investigation is currently open and no other signs of Rico have been reported since. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments regarding the material we cover, drop us a message. We always reply.